two units ago, we talked about how we declare array variables, how we instantiate array objects, how we manipulate arrays using subscripts and loops and methods. And now we're going to cover some of the more complex operations you might do on arrays, uh, including searching and sorting. We're also going to talk about two-dimensional and otherwise multi-dimensional arrays as well. You'll find that multi-dimensional arrays are going to lend themselves to a lot of different really useful and fun applications. So I, I think it's going to be a cool one. Anytime we're building anything, there's a good chance we're going to have to search for some element within an array uh, or a collection of other elements. You know, one example that you may remember is the index of method that we use with strings. That's, that's a search. We're going to talk today about two very typical methods that we might use to search for one particular target element in an array of elements. We'll talk about a linear search and a binary search. The most straightforward way that we could search for something is really just to look element by element until we find it. That's what we see implemented here. We're looking through uh, an array of ints for some target value, which we're calling search value. This method is going to return either the index of the first matching value or negative one if that value is not actually in the array. That works for ints, but suppose we have an array of names that we want to search for a particular name that we're, we're looking for. Well, a name is just a string. We can't use the search method that we defined in the previous slide, and the only difference will be that this accepts an array of strings and a, a, the target is going to be a string variable. The only real difference here is that in our comparison, rather than using the equals equals operator as we might do with primitive data, here we're, we're comparing two objects. So we're going to use the dot equals method, which is going to return true or false depending on whether the target value and the current element we're looking at are equal. Pretty straightforward. Now we can take this one step further, right? Let's generalize it to work with any object, not just strings. All we do is just substitute object for string in the parameter list. You can see that up here. And the method is still going to work for strings. We can use it to search an array of student objects for a target student. You know, if we're assuming that the student class includes an equals method, right? That equals method has to be defined in student class for us to be able to use it. Uh, so take a look at this. Here's a code segment that uses that search method to search arrays of two different types. You can see we have an array of string called string array. You can see we have an array of students called student array. We make a target and then we can go through. Now that linear search is going to work just fine for arrays that are pretty small, a few hundred elements maybe. But as the array gets really big, you know, think in the thousands or millions of elements, the behavior of the search starts to degrade a little bit. We'll talk more about this in a future unit, and you'll discuss this way more in analysis of algorithms. When we have an array of elements that are in ascending order, you know, if you think like a, a list of numbers or names, there's actually a much better way to solve this problem, a much better way to search than the linear search. Now, if you're wondering why we would want a better method, I mean, think about this, right? It, it, think about the best case, the worst case, and the average case of a linear search. Best case is you find it at the very first place you look. That's a single comparison that you do immediately you find it and return. Worst case is it's in the nth place or it's not even there. And in that case, you do n comparisons for a list of n items. On average, you can show that it's going to take n plus one over two comparisons. And there's a little, a little explanation of that here that I encourage you to pause the video and take a look at uh, or open up the slides and click that link to see. But the big idea to take away is that we can do better. And importantly, we can do better if we sort our list ahead of time. Now, if you think this makes sense, you don't actually use a linear search to find a name in, say, a phone book. If we were looking up Mike Smith in a thousand page phone book, you could use this dumb brute force algorithm where you open the phone book to page one and you look at the first entry. You ask, is this entry Mike Smith? Uh, if it's yes, you go to step four. If it's no, well, was this the last entry? And if no, then go to the next entry and repeat step three. If yes, go to step five. Uh, if you got to step four, it means you found him. If you got to step five, it means he's not in the phone book. You're just, you're just looking entry by entry from the very beginning. Obviously, this is not how you do it. There's a much better way. And that is essentially starting somewhere in the middle. You'd open up the phone book somewhere halfway through, and you'd say, all right, well, is the name I'm looking for to the right or the left? And then you'd take the chunk of pages to the right, and you'd open to the middle somewhere there. And you'd say, all right, well, in the, well all the pages that are left... I've opened to the middle of that chunk is the name I'm looking for to the right or the left. And you do this until you got to the specific page that the name was on. And then you'd split that page in half and you'd think, all right, well, let me get down to the, to the half of this page where I want to be. 
right? Yeah, essentially, you're just splitting the problem in half over and over and over again, considering the two options at every juncture. Either the name is before this or it's after this. We call this a binary search, and it's way faster for very large arrays, assuming that the list is sorted. The basic idea is just to examine the element at an array's midpoint on every pass through the search loop. And if the current element that we're looking at matches the target that we're looking for, we return that position. Now, if the current element is less than the target, we're going to take the part of the array to the right of the midpoint, which contains the positions of the greater element. Otherwise, we're going to search the part of the array to the left of the midpoint, which has all the positions that uh, have items that are less. And on each pass through the loop, the leftmost or the rightmost position gets adjusted so that we can track which portion of the array we're actually looking at. You can see a pictorial representation here. Suppose we have this array and we're looking for the value 5. All right, well, look. I start looking at 9, okay, and I think, well, is the value I'm looking for to the left or to the right of 9? It's to the left. So let me look at everything before that 9. I adjust my right-hand end of the array and I bring it to the left uh, so that I'm only dealing with the first chunk of the array. Now I can split that array. Well, maybe I treat 3 as my midpoint now because it's not a perfectly odd number length. Treat 3 as my midpoint. Uh, is 5 greater than or less than 3? Well, it's greater, so I take the, I take the chunk to the right. right? I, I bring my left endpoint to the right, and now I'm looking at just 5 and 7. And uh, now with an array of, of only length 2, I can essentially arbitrarily choose which of these two elements to treat as my midpoint. We'll look at that first one. It happens to be 5, and I found my element. You can imagine we're sort of gradually narrowing our focus in the array by changing what our left and right endpoints are. Now, the key questions you, would, you should ask yourself if you're thinking about how you might implement this are, well, you know, how are you going to keep track of which part of the array you're searching? Because maybe you start with the whole thing, but ultimately you're narrowing down the window or the frame in the array that you're actually looking at. You're going to think about how you decide what the midpoint of the array actually is. You know, in, in all situations, an, an odd-length array, an even-length array, and also an array of, say, only two elements like we just saw in the previous slide. How are you going to know when you've searched the whole array, and what happens if you don't actually find the target? These are all important questions to consider if you're trying to put together an implementation of a binary search. Now, here's one implementation of a binary search for uh, an array of ints, if we're looking for a particular int target value. We start with a left bound of 0 and a right bound of the length of our array minus 1, and that makes sense. We're considering the whole array. So our left and right bounds are just the beginning and end of the array. As long as left is less than or equal to right. Now, if you look in this loop, that sort of implies that we're going to be adjusting left and right. So as long as left is less than right, as long as the two haven't crossed, we find our midpoint. In this case, this is how we've decided to compute it, left plus right divided by two. And if our midpoint is equal to the target, well, we return right away. We found it. Otherwise, we need to do a little comparison. We need to see, well, is our midpoint less than our, our target value or is it greater than our target value? And based on that, we're either going to adjust left or we're going to adjust right. And ultimately, if we get to this while loop and our left and right endpoints cross, in other words, we end up with right being greater than left, well, that just means that the element we were looking for is not in the array. And we can return minus one because it just wasn't there. We didn't find the target. Again, we could generalize this for any object. The only hairy part that we run into is what happens when we need to do these little comparisons. So if we have, if we're, if we're looking at two elements to see if they're equal, well, that's relatively straightforward. We've seen that before. We use the equals method, and ho we're hoping that it's been defined for whatever type of object we're looking at. But if you want to compare whether the element that you're looking for is less than or greater than the midpoint, well, that's not necessarily straightforward to do with an object. In fact, objects don't understand the less than or greater than or equal to operators. Well, they understand the equal to operator, but it doesn't test equality. It tests identity. Our answer to this challenge is to implement the comparable interface. And what the comparable interface does is it authorizes the method compare to, which essentially performs three different comparisons. However we define in the compare to method, which we'll implement, compare to will either return zero, if the two objects are equal according to our definition, it'll return a negative number if object 1 is less than object 2. In other words, if the calling object is less than the parameter object. And it'll return a positive integer if object 1 is greater than object 2. Now, the, the string class implements the comparable interface. And so uh, the output that we're looking at here is sensible. 
I can take a string Julian and I can compare it to Kindle, to a Julian, to itself, and to Eleanor. And in this case, you can see what the outputs will be. Right? Comparing it to Kindle returns negative one. Looks like Julian is less than Kindle. I can compare it to the string literal Julian, and that's going to turn zero because those are actually both identical. And I can also compare it to the string Eleanor, and in this case, that will return five because Julian apparently is greater than Eleanor. Now, the exact numbers that are outputted here, that's dependent on a lot of things, including the particular system that you're running. But the key is this, right? If the first thing is less than the parameter, it's going to be negative. If they're equal, it's going to be zero. And if the first thing, the calling object is greater than the parameter object, it's going to be positive. That's what you can bank on. So now coming back to our binary search, one important thing we have to note. Before you call the compare to method on some arbitrary object, and in this method, that's what we have. We have objects. We don't have some more specific type. Before you call the compare to method, you have to first cast it to comparable because object itself, the object class in Java, doesn't implement the comparable interface, and it doesn't include a compare to method, which means if you're writing a method that generally deals with objects rather than some specific type that we know is comparable, well, you know that you have to cast it to comparable before you use a specifically comparable method. If you take a look here, if we're trying to do a binary search on this array of objects, you can see what that ends up looking like. Uh, we'll, we'll store our, our comparison result into a variable called result. And in this case, we're casting the, uh, the element that we're looking at, the midpoint element, to comparable so that we can use the compare to method. Other than that, it looks very much the same as what we had in the int version of this method. So that's from the perspective of a class or an object using comparable objects, but it's also worthwhile to think about how we would actually implement the method compare to. And the key thing to keep in mind here is that any object that it makes sense to order by the relations less than or greater than or equal to, you want to make those implement the comparable interface and you, so that they understand the compare to method. This can mean lots of different things. It's, it's totally dependent on the particular problem you're solving and the particular data type you're working with. If you take a look here, right? Suppose that we're working with the student class that we worked with so much before. Suppose we wanna compare student names and we wanna use that to order our student objects. Well, we could leave everything the same. The only things we'd change is we would uh, make it implement comparable. You can see that right up here. And we'd also implement the compare to method. And this is pretty straightforward too. It takes a generic object as uh, its parameter. First, we check to see if the parameter is actually even a student. And we know that if it's not a student, uh, they can't be equal. So we actually here, are gonna, we're gonna throw an exception, an illegal argument exception. But if the parameter object is a student, well, then we're going to go ahead and get its name. So in other words, we're gonna cast that generic object to a student. We'll get call get name and store it into other name. And then we just return compare to between the two names. So in this case, compare to for two student objects is essentially defined using compare to for two string objects. But we could, we could really do that ordering based on anything we'd like. We could define the student class compare to method to work based on test score average or based on any other metric that we decided we wanted to use. Okay, before you close up shop, big ideas, uh, write me a linear search method that searches an array of objects for some target. We want it to be able to take uh, two parameters, an array of objects, again, not particular ints, not you know students or whatever, but a general object, and whatever the target object we're looking for is. This is not a coding exercise, but this is one uh, for just helping you think through the binary search. Which elements would you examine if you were searching for the value 100 in the array 34, 56, 78, 85, 99? Then think about this modification to linear search that uh, makes it perform a little better if the list is sorted. Uh, if the target element is less than the current element, the one you're looking for is less than the current one you're considering, then that means that the, the target can't actually be in the current array, assuming that the list is sorted. So modify the linear search method that we looked at earlier in lecture uh, so that it can accomplish this. Finally, pick through this code segment and uh, see that you understand how it is actually going to work and what it does. That's it for today.